Welcome to First Words, a podcast presented by the First United Methodist Church of Florence. Today's message is brought to you by Youth Director Mac Nolan. A man walked into a doctor's office and said, Doctor, I have this awful headache that never leaves me. Could you give me something for it? I will, said the doctor, but I'd like to check a few things out first. Tell me, do you drink liquor? Liquor, said the man indignantly. I never touch the filthy stuff. Well, said the doctor, how about smoking? Smoking, replied the man. I think smoking is disgusting. I've never touched tobacco. Well, said the doctor, I'm a bit embarrassed to ask this, but you know how some men are. Do you do any running around at night? Of course not, the man replied. What do you take me for? I'm in bed every night by 10 o'clock at the latest. The doctor paused. Tell me, the pain in your head that you speak of, is it a sharp shooting kind of pain? Yes, said the man, that's exactly it, a sharp shooting pain. Ah, said the doctor, it's simple, my dear fellow. Your trouble is you have your halo on much too tight. This story makes light of the way that Christians often wear their piety, their religiosity, their self-righteousness with such pride that it makes us unbearable to be around. Certain we aren't like them, we judge others. And all too often, we as Christians fall into the trap of buckling down, tightening our halos, and doing anything within our power to make ourselves worthy of God's favor. We do our best and hope that it's good enough. A couple of months ago, the youth and I were looking at the story of the fall from Genesis 3. We were exploring the ways that sin disrupts our relationships with ourselves, with others, with God, and with creation. In the middle of the lesson, one of my students raised her hand and interrupted, saying, how many times Can we sin before we don't go to heaven? It was a harmless question, and I knew what she actually meant, and so it was fair for me to say, there's no limit, and I'm grateful that God doesn't deal with me the way I probably deserve. But the more I thought about it after that night, the more it puzzled me. And in the end, I think it actually ended up bringing a couple of traps that we fall into when we think about sin and when we think about God. The first trap is we're viewing sin all wrong. And when we ask how many times we can do something before the consequence, we're focusing on the wrong question. When we view sin this way, it's almost as if we're looking to see just how much we can get away with, as if we are ever capable of pulling one over on God. The trap is, avoiding sin isn't just something we do so we can get into heaven. And Jesus doesn't invite us to repent just so we can obtain eternal life. Let me explain what I mean. In John chapter 8, Jesus encounters a woman caught in adultery. The Pharisees bring the woman to Jesus and they say, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to him to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus responded, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. When they heard it, they went away one by one beginning with the elders, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, 
Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. Do not sin again, or go and sin no more, is a command from Jesus to the woman. However, it's not quite as literal as we so often think of it. By challenging any one among you, Jesus excludes himself as a potential stone thrower. Though Jesus would have been the only person present who was without sin, Jesus does not lift a pebble against the woman. Go in and sin no more is therefore not a punishment or a sentence, but rather an invitation to the woman. Jesus is inviting her to rethink her actions because they're harmful to her, her relationship with God, and the relationship she has with others around her. It's an invitation from Jesus to do no harm, to resemble him more, and to be more acutely aware of her desires and her actions. I've heard people use this story as the banner for repentance. And it can be. It's just, when we use this verse, go and sin no more, to set an impossible standard for other people or for ourselves, we forget the spirit of the passage. As a command, it's impossible to fulfill. And Jesus would have known this. As a command, go and sin no more, the woman is doomed before she even begins. Each of us sin, even the best of us, in dozens of ways, consciously or not, every day. That's exactly what disqualified the Pharisees from punishing the woman. The Pharisees were not without sin. We are not without sin. As an invitation, however, go and sin no more calls us to a deeper and more meaningful way to go about our days, knowing that there is grace for us if, maybe when, we inevitably sin again. And even though this isn't in the Bible, I confidently suspect that if Jesus ever crossed paths with that woman again, he would have offered her the same grace and reminder as he did before. Go and sin no more. The second trap we fall into when we ask the question, how many times can I sin before I don't go to heaven, is that we're viewing God all wrong. Too often, we think of God as a spy, a punisher, a disciplinarian. God, at least in our minds, is just waiting for us to mess up. God is tallying our mistakes and sins and downfalls. And maybe when we die, God will use all of this against us, we think. But God is not our enemy. God is not determined to tempt us and try us and test us. That notion is born from a legalistic religion, one where right and wrong behaviors take precedence over God's deep and unfailing love for us. The Father's love, I tell you, is revealed in the Son. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8 reads, While we were still weak, at the right moment, Christ died for the ungodly people. It isn't often that someone will die for a righteous person, though maybe someone might dare to die for a good person. But God shows his love for us, because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In essence, the cross reveals just how deep God's love for us goes. When we wear our halos too tight, we inadvertently send the message that we are somehow able to make ourselves worthy of God's favor and God's love. We measure ourselves by our good works, by how well we keep the commandments, by the prayers that we pray and the rituals that we follow. By keeping the law or following the rules, we cannot make ourselves worthy. We cannot set ourselves free. And I'm grateful for the ways that I do not have to earn my own salvation, because if I could make myself worthy, 
I would have to spend every day living up to the impossible standard, and there's no room for error. Faith, then, is the admission that one cannot justify oneself, and that ultimately, it is God who will grant us justification by his grace. In this context, the word grace means the gratuitous, undeserved, unearned love and favor of God for us. Donald McCullough puts it this way. Grace means that in the middle of our struggle, the referee blows the whistle and announces the end of the game. We are declared winners and sent to the showers. It's over for all huffing, puffing piety to earn God's favor. It's finished for all the sweat-soaked straining to secure self-worth. It's the end of all competitive scrambling to get ahead of others in the game. Grace means that God is on our side, and thus we are victors regardless of how well we played the game. We might as well head for the showers and the champagne celebration. If the gospel means what I think it means, then no matter how dutiful or prayerful we are, we cannot save ourselves. What Jesus did was more than sufficient. Those who wear tilted halos not only know this, but boast in this. As a result, according to author and theologian Brennan Manning, the tilted halo of the saved sinner is worn loosely and with easy grace. I believe there are three characteristics of those who wear tilted halos. The first characteristic is that our tilted halos call us to repentance. Romans chapter 5, 11 reads, We even take pride in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the one through whom we now have a restored relationship with God. If grace is truly undeserved, then the saved sinner must know that repentance is not what we do in order to earn forgiveness. Rather, repentance is what we do because we have been forgiven. Imagine if Jesus had had a different response to the woman caught in adultery. Imagine if he had acted with disgust or disappointment or anger. But by responding in the way he responded, Jesus offered this woman grace. Thus, the woman's assumed repentance serves as an expression of gratitude rather than an effort to earn forgiveness. By first restoring us to relationship with God, while we were still sinners, ungodly people, Christ proves that the cycle is indeed forgiveness and then repentance, instead of repentance and then forgiveness. The second characteristic of our tilted halo is that they lead us from mistrust into trust. The reason we become fixated on earning our salvation and consequently maintaining our own salvation is because the gospel of grace often sounds far too good to be true. As if it weren't far-fetched enough to believe that we were somehow inherently worth dying for, we have to now believe that while there is nothing we can do to earn God's favor or love, there's also nothing we can do to lose God's favor or love. We have to believe that we are God's beloved, and God isn't just sitting there waiting for us to mess up to revoke that status. Instead of doubting their own worth and God's intentions, the person marked by a tilted halo embodies Romans chapter 5, 3 through 5. We take pride in our problems because we know that trouble produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. This hope doesn't put us to shame because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. To put it simply, Paul is telling us that we can trust in God regardless of the circumstances because God has proven that God is worth trusting. 
The third characteristic of those with tilted halos is honesty. Manning writes, how difficult is it to be honest, to accept that I am unacceptable, to renounce self-justification, to give up the pretense that my prayers, spiritual insight, tithing, and success in ministry have made me pleasing to God. I am lovable only because he loves me. We are honest when we face the truth of who we are instead of constructing an image we use for self-protection or to impress others. We must admit the truth that being honest means being broken, and being broken means being in need of grace, and being in need of grace means we must rely on God. But not only does honesty drive us into a deeper relationship with God, it forces us into deeper relationship with others. If we are broken by nature of being human, and we are lovable only because God loves us, then the same is true of our brothers and sisters. We cannot hold at a distance that which we understand. There is no hierarchy in the kingdom of God. There is no competition over who is more favored. There is no loved or unloved. We are all held as beloved treasures of God. When we believe this, it becomes impossible to not believe this about others, to regard them as other at all, to judge them as easily as we perhaps once did. When we acknowledge the grace that is found in our own tilted halo, it actually becomes quite liberating to help others find the courage to loosen theirs. The grace of God tells us that we are accepted just as we are. Even if we never become the kind of people that we want to be or think we should be, even if we have a long way to go before we reach our goals, even if when we lie down at night and start counting, our failures long outweigh our achievements, we are nonetheless accepted by God. This is your identity. Take and believe it. Amen. Thank you for listening to First Words. For more information about our services or how to get involved in our community, visit us at fumcflorence.org or facebook.com slash florencefumc.org.